Good morning. Good morning. Would you stand with me? Let's get ready for church. Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Have you come this morning to worship God? Okay, three of you did. Let me, let, me, let me introduce you. You're at church this morning, and we came to worship the Lord. So let's turn to him in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. God, we thank you for the day that we can come today and worship you. Lord, that we can join together without any fear, without any issue, God, and focus our attention on you, the living God. Father, we thank you that you love us so much that you sent your one and only son. We thank you, Lord, for this season that we're in, and we fix our eyes on you, and we choose right from the very beginning today to worship you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Glory to the world, the
Thank you, Lord. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you, God. Dark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sin is reconciled. Joyful all the nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies with the jelly. Let your glory reign, 
shining like the day King of heaven comes Oh, I love you, Lord I love you, Lord Jesus Come all you weary Come all you thirsty Come to the well that never runs dry His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in Him Will live forever The power of hell Forever defeated Now it is well I'm walking in freedom For God so loved God so loved the world failures bring all your failures bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting there with open arms for God to love for God so loves the world that he gave us his one and only son to save God so loved, God 
times I read through scripture, every time where I read through passages, especially Old Testament passages, where they sent the worship team, so to speak, ahead of the army, not the greatest natural strategic thing to do in battle, but to send the worship team out ahead first, setting their eyes completely on God, not the enemy in front of them. And the reality of the fact that it's going to be God that will defeat, not them. Whenever we're faced with things, whenever we come against trouble, whenever we have issues going on in our life, one of the first things we should do is come before Him in worship. Because it gets our eyes off of the garbage and gets our eyes fixed on Him. The King of kings, the Lord of lords. God who created the entire universe. It gets our eyes fixed on Him. And when our eyes are fixed on Him, something happens. Our faith level comes up. No longer are we going, oh, how will I ever get through this? No, no, I know how I'm going to get through this. He's going to carry me through this. Because He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is my ever-present help in times of trouble. He is my Savior. And when I fix my eyes on my Savior, my faith arises and the enemies are scattered. God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your great love. Thank you, Lord, 
God, today as we fixate our eyes on your love for us, God, we praise you for it. God, we thank you for it. For you, Lord, you are a great God. You're powerful. You're magnificent. Lord, we think of all the things that you have done in our lives up until this moment, and Lord, we give you praise for them. Lord, you have saved us. You've saved our soul, but Lord, you've also saved our bodies countless times. You've brought healing. You've brought restoration to, to relationships. You, you've brought healing to families. Lord, you've brought healings to our minds. Father, we thank you for all the things you've done. You've brought provision. You've brought us to this moment today. You've given us the opportunity to come and worship you. We thank you, Lord, and we praise your name. For you, God, you are great. Praise your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, Merry Christmas. We got a couple of announcements for you before I dive into the Word this morning. I'm going to clear some stuff off because I don't want to knock things over again. Uh, I just did. We're good. The announcements for you are this. Let's cl- the closest one would be Christmas Eve service. Anybody excited for Christmas? Woo! Few people happy about Christmas coming up. Christmas Eve service, Hans, is going to be at what time? Six o'clock? Six o'clock right here. If you're going to be a part of the Christmas Eve service, it is generally a one-hour service. It is not long. It is just an opportunity for us to come and to worship God together on Christmas Eve and center our eyes on Him. Amen? Amen. Now, with that being said, we're not going to be here. I know. <laughs> the last few years, we haven't been able to take opportunity of taking in any conferences or anything like that. So for this next week, starting tomorrow, Christina and I and the kids, we are going to be going, and we're going to be spending a week, let's put it this way, for some personal and professional development. We just want to make sure that we get ourselves poured into, that we get equipped and ready for this next season. So we're taking the next four days for that leading into Christmas, and then right after that, We're on vacation. So if you have any issues, if you've got any problems whatsoever, you can contact Jeff. (laughs) Jeff will be able to handle all of your problems and your woes. Isn't he great for volunteering for that? (laughs) We have Alpha coming up. Alpha starts when, Evan? January 18th is Alpha. That is on Thursday nights, right? Tuesday nights. (laughs) Not even close. Tuesday night. If you want to be a part of Alpha, talk to Evan and Melissa or Kara following the service. If you you don't know what it is, talk to them. Ask them about it. If you know someone that has not quite yet accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, or if they're kind of questioning, like, what is God all about? This here is an opportunity over 12 weeks to have a conversation and to talk about different opinions, different statements of faith, different aspects of what we believe. And at the end of it, they will be in a place where they can make a choice for themselves what it is that they believe. So it's 12 weeks, literally, just to lay out what we believe. That is something I think that everyone, if we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, as the only one to heaven, we should be wanting as many people to go through something like this, right? So make sure you grab one of those red cards on your way out and invite your neighbor, invite someone out to it. Make sure we spread the word because we want to make sure there's an opportunity for everyone that we know to make a choice. At the end of the day, all we can do is present them with the truth. Give them an opportunity to explore it and then choose. So that is what Alpha is. It's coming up in January. The other one is there is a Bible study on Wednesday nights. Jameson, what what date does that start on? January 12th to February something. You're better than I. I didn't even know when it started. January 12th to February something, six weeks after the 12th. There's a six-week Bible study on the the book of James. Wonderful book to jump into. So if you want to get into part of a Bible study, that one will be taking place on Wednesday evenings. All the information is in the foyer. And I think that's all of my announcements I have for you. No. What do you got there, Jeff? Ah. Yes. 
we are endeavoring to launch our children's ministry again in the, in the new year. Please see Jeff. If you have volunteered to be a part of that, you need to get your police check done so we can have a, a, a place that we can show due diligence, that we try and strive our absolute very best to provide a safe place for our children and those in the vulnerable sector to come to worship and to get to know God. So if you can uh, just see Jeff fall in the service and get your letter for the police check, because that'll make it uh, not cost nearly as much when you go to the police station, that would be great. If you live in Peterborough, by the way, your police checks, or in the Peterborough catchment, if the Peterborough police are your people to go to for a police check, don't go to the station. It is now all done online. You go to the station, they'll turn you away at the door. So don't waste your time driving downtown. Get the letter. You'll scan it in, and you'll send it in. It'll be all done online. It's not too, too difficult if you have troubles with it. I'm sure that someone who has also done it recently, like Lois, might be able to help you. (laughs) Perfect. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Truly, God, thank you for this day. The opportunity we have now, Lord, to continue in worship by going to your word. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the power that's in your word. And Lord, as we look at your word today, would you open our ears to hear it? Father, we ask you to anoint our minds to understand it and our hearts to receive it. And Father, at the end of this day, we will be able to go out of here knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have met with you and that we have been transformed a little more into your likeness as we meditate on your word. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen Amen and amen. This morning is the fourth week in the Advent season. We have been journeying through the different weeks of Advent. We've gone from faith to hope to joy. Today, we are on week four. Each week, we light a different candle, symbolizing the hope, symbolizing the faith, symbolizing the joy, symbolizing the light that Jesus brings in Christmas. Amen? So today we're on the fourth week. Our sign on the wall says peace. This is a tricky week. This is one of those weeks, depending on what church you go to, it it changes words from one to another. Some call it faith, hope, joy, and peace. Some go faith, love, joy, and love. Hope, joy, and love. It's an interchangeable thing because, well, what is the peace of God? The peace of God is shalom. Shalom literally means nothing missing, nothing broken. When you pronounce shalom over something, over someone, when you give them that blessing of saying shalom, you're not just saying hi. You're not just saying, hey, peace. You're, you're literally pronouncing, may the peace of God, may you have nothing missing and nothing broken in your life. A little more powerful, isn't it? And when you think of what it took for us to truly have that peace, it took Christ coming as a baby, living perfectly for 33 and a half years, dying on a cross, shedding his blood so you and I could be forgiven, being laid in a tomb and three days later rising again. Why? Because he loves us. So the peace and the love, they can be interchanged back and forth because that peace is just pure, absolute love from God. So Jameson, would you come and light our candles for us this morning? For a second time, he lit them this morning when we first came in to open the church, and, and he blew them out, and I came up, and I didn't, I didn't think about the fact that he blew them out, and I walked across, and I saw the hot tub over here, and as I walked across, all I smelled was smoke. <laughs> Little mini heart attack took place right here this morning until I realized it was the candle slowly kind of going out. After our, our, our word this morning, we are going to have a water baptism service and celebrate there too. So we're going to dive into this right away. John chapter 3, verse 16 says this, For God so loved the world, he so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. This week, as we look at the fourth week in Advent, and we look at the peace and the love of the season, it is all because God loved the world. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12 in the message say it like this. My beloved friends. I like the message because it's, it's not something I would study for theological purposes, but it's something I would read after reading the original text just to let it come alive to me and understand it a little more. So here's how the message paraphrase puts it. My beloved friends, 
let us continue to love each other since love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. Grateful for that? Amen? The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God because God is love. So you can't know him if you don't love. This is how God showed his love for us. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. This is the kind of love we are talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away our sin and the damage they've done to our relationship with God. My dear friends, if God loved us like that, we certainly ought to love each other. No one has seen God ever. But if we love one another, God dwells deeply within us and his love becomes complete in us. Perfect love. Love. All of this. The whole Christmas season, everything that is happening right now, the, the tree, the, the gifts under the tree, all of it is because of love. God's great love for you and for me. See, Christmas is much more than the lights. It, it's much more than the carols that we sing. It's even more than the hot apple cider with cinnamon sticks in it. It's more than the Hallmark feel-good Christmas movies. Christmas is more than the gifts under the tree. In fact, the greatest gift that the world ever received is at the foot of a tree, at the foot of the cross. But that gift first made his presence known in a much different way, in a manger, in a stall, on a clear night with stars in the sky, with angels making their presence known and choirs of angels singing in the sky, shepherds out in a field. That night was a much different night. But from the manger to the cross, the message never changed. The message is love. So we light the fourth candle. We go through the fourth week of Advent and we remember the love that God has for us. It's because God so loved the world. We're going to read from Luke chapter 2. I don't know what your tradition is in your home, but our tradition in our home, the tradition in Christina's, in Christina's family's home, is before anyone on Christmas morning is able to open a gift. They're able to open the stockings. But before anyone is allowed to open a gift, out comes the Bible, and we read from Luke chapter 2 to center our eyes, not on the gifts under the tree, but the gift that God gave us. So would you open your Bible to Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1. We're going to read verse 1 through 20, and when you got it, say, mm-hmm, I got it. All right, you're faster than me. Hold up. Mm hmm, I got it. Hans. Now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a sentence census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David. In order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child, while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flocks by night. 
And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God on the highest, and on earth peace among men, with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which he had been told them about the child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen just as had been told to them. Thank you, Hans. Verse 10. Verse 10 is the, the message of love. And it's a message of love to the entire world. Let's read it one more time. Verse 10. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I think they would have naturally been afraid. Standing out on a hillside at night with their sheep, and all of a sudden they look up, and it's not, a, it's not a pizza dream that's taking place. They're awake. They're watching to make sure wolves don't come in and eat their sheep. And they're sitting there, and they look up, and there in front of their eyes is the angel of the Lord in the sky. I would be terrified. So the angel says, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Good news that will cause great joy for all the people. See, we needed the good news. We needed the gospel message. See, the fact is, is that none of us are perfect. Don't be so quick to agree, Christina. <laughs> None of us are perfect. Every single one of us have made mistakes. And at times, we still make poor choices. No, not poor. We make outright bad choices. They're not mistakes. They're not, oops, I fell down. They are choices that we make. And the reality is, is that sin separates from God. Sin brings in separation. It's like oil and water. The two don't coexist. You can't put them in the same pot and expect them to blend in perfectly like oil and water, holy and unholy, don't mix. Light and darkness don't coexist. And because of sin, because of the incompatibility of the purity of God and the vileness of sin, Sin has to be judged. And the judgment of sin is death. The judgment of sin is eternity separated from God. The judgment of sin is hell. Wow, this doesn't sound like a really good Christmas message, Pastor. But it is. See, in case I haven't mentioned it before, hell is real. Hell is horrible. Hell is a place of torture and suffering with no relief, with no joy, with no peace, with no parties, with no pleasure, without, without any time out or just give me a break moment. Hell is hell. And sin is has to be judged. But church, brothers and sisters in Christ, can I tell you that although sin has to be judged, take a deep breath, sigh of relief, 
you're not the judge. You're not the judge. You don't have that pressure weighing on your shoulders. In fact, the judge, the judge is the one who made a way for us to be acquitted, to be forgiven. See, to judge someone, to judge someone is to pronounce verdict. You've heard in the Bible, we're going to go there in a minute, do not judge. See, to judge in that case is not the, you know, weighing out or evaluating. No, no, no. The word judge here is to pronounce verdict. To drop the hammer. But in this court, the gavel is final. In this court, there are no appeals. There is no parole. There's no getting out early on good behavior. Judgment is final. But breathe easy, you're not the judge. But court is not in session. Thank you, Jesus. Court is not in session. In fact, when you confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you don't have to worry about court ever being in session. You won't have to stand before the judgment seat. Court is not in session. See, until court is in session, the judge is not acting as judge. The judge is acting as savior. The judge is acting as your, your defense attorney trying to plead with you. The judge is sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and he's making intercession on your behalf. He's giving you opportunity. See, the judge is not wearing his, his judge's uniform right now. No, no, no. He's wearing the uniform of a Savior, and he's standing at the door of your heart, and he's knocking. And he's saying, if you just open up, we don't have to worry about going to court. If you just open up, I'll come in. I'll sup with you. That word sup is not just eating supper. That word sup is to literally dip the bread in the wine. What does that mean? It's literally to make covenant with you. If you just open your life up to me, I will make a covenant, a life agreement that cannot be broken. I will not break it. If you just open the door, I will come in and I will forgive and I will wash and I will acquit. The opportunity is only as long as court is not in session. The opportunity to accept his acquittal, his forgiveness, is only, as, only there until court is in session. So when does court come in session? Court comes into session when you take your last breath. The moment you breathe your last, that is the end of opportunity to accept the acquittal that he has offered. See, the judge, the Savior, God, is not only waiting, he's wanting. He's wanting relationship with us. He doesn't want to just give a get out of hell, hell free uh, gift card and let you be on your merry way. He actually wants daily living relationship with us. How amazing is that? That God who created everything honestly wants to have relationship with me. That's why he came. Because God loves you. And although court is not in session, it is only held off as long as there is still breath in your lungs. So do me a favor. Would you take a breath? Could you do it? So you have opportunity. But you know what else it says? Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So we choose to praise him now. He is the judge. And that's why in his sermon, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the one that we have been studying now for a few weeks, in his sermon, in Matthew chapter 7, he says the words, not to judge. Would you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, verse 1? If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. I got it on the screen behind me. Matthew Chapter 7, verse 1. And if you don't have a Bible, 
and you would like a Bible, make sure you see Hans after the service, and I'm sure he'll find you one. We've got a bunch of them in the room right over here. Are you there, Matthew 7, verse 1? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do not judge. Pretty plain and simple. There's not a whole lot of interpretation that needs to be given to that, is there? Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye. Then you'll be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. He's not saying to not remove the speck, by the way. Sermon for another day. <laughs> do not give dogs what is sacred. and Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. Wow. What a passage. Let's go through this on the last Sunday before Christmas. Note that the passage is not saying to look the other way when your brother or sister in the faith is living in sin. This passage is not saying to look the other way or to ignore when your brother or sister is act in Christ is acting in a way unbecoming of a Christian. It's not saying to, to look the other way and ignore the elephant in the room when your brother or sister in Christ is trying to hide some sin in their life. What he is saying is don't act like the gavel is in your hand, because it's not. Reach with the love that is in your hand. Reach with the love that he is offering you to reach with, because his love is what you have been given. His love is all that you have. His love is all that you need to reach and help your brother or sister in Christ get out of a messy situation. Don't pretend to be perfect either. Don't pretend to be perfect either. Far too long, I think, the church has had this reputation of being a bunch of hypocrites because they claim to be perfect, but they're really not. Hey, hey, I ain't making any lies. I'm not perfect. I make bad choices but I am striving with everything in me to not make those choices again. When I make a wrong choice, I recognize it. I ask for forgiveness, but there's this word called metanoia in repentance. It's not just saying I'm sorry. It's I make that bad choice about that, and I completely turn my way, and I walk the other direction. I change my lifestyle so I don't go back to it. Don't act like you're perfect because we all make bad choices. Deal with the sin. Have some metanoia take place in you. Turn from your, your old ways. Don't go back to it. Ask for forgiveness. Deal with it and then walk with a humble heart striving for righteousness. Then, help a brother out. Don't drop the hammer on him. Don't drop the hammer or the gavel with your tongue, with your attitude, or with your actions. That is is not love. Did you hear what Evan did last week? Oh my goodness. That's not love. Oh, there, here comes Evan. I'm not going to look at him. I saw what he did. That's not love. That's acting like the gavel is in my hand, and it's not. I didn't see anything that Evan did last week other than have a humble heart to want to see Alpha go. So, I mean, using you as an illustration... One of the casualties of being on the front row. <laughs> but reach in love. Because judging with your tongue, with your thoughts, with your attitudes, with your actions to another brother or sister in Christ is not love. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. Good news is what he brought. Good news is what you have. The good news is the gospel message of great joy that will be for all people. The good news... The gospel message is a message of love. And yes, it is a message for all mankind. 
Salvation is available for anyone that would put their trust in God. However, unfortunately, there are some. We can't ignore that latter part of the passage where it says, do not give the dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to the pigs. If you do, they may trample them under your feet and turn and tear you to pieces. What is he talking about? There are some who will absolutely determine within themselves to never accept the message of the gospel. The metaphors that Jesus uses here in verse six of the dogs and the pigs, these metaphors are referring to a language that they would have understood what he was saying. They're referring to no matter what their background is, no matter where they come from, it doesn't matter their family, whether they're Jewish or not. It doesn't matter whether they come from a family that believes in God or a family that doesn't. There are some who will refuse to accept the gospel message. There are some that will be raised in church families that will set their minds on never accepting Jesus Christ. We pray for them. We absolutely intercede for them. But he's giving a warning here. Because sometimes their goal in mind is to be a distraction. Sometimes their goal in mind is to destroy, deface the witness and the message of the gospel. And Jesus is giving a warning. See, the reality is, is that everyone has a choice. Our job? Our job is simply to present them with the truth. It is not my job to preach a sermon that will make all of Millbrook get saved. It is not my job to save someone. It is not your job to save someone. It is your job. It is our duty. It is our responsibility. It is our honor and our privilege to present them with the gospel message to present the truth, the love of God, and allow them then to make a choice. We intercede, we pray, absolutely. The reality is, is everyone has a choice. Jesus chose to come. He chose to give us Christmas and Easter. He chose. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 in the message says this. So what do we do? talking to those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So what do we do? Keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? I should hope not. If we left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? Or did, didn't you realize we packed up and left there for good? That is what happened in baptism. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. When we came up out of the water, we entered into a new country of grace, a new life in a new land. That's what water baptism, or sorry, what baptism into the life of Jesus means. When we are lowered into the water, it is like the burial of Jesus. When we are raised up out of the water, it is like the resurrection of Jesus. Each of us is raised into a light-filled world by our Father so that we can see where we're going in our new grace-sovereign country. Could it be any clearer in verse 6? Our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ. Divisive end to sin, miserable life, no longer at sin's every beck and call. What we believe is this. If we get included in Christ's sin-conquering death, we also get included in his life-saving resurrection. We know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal of the end of death as the end. Never again will death have the last word. When Jesus died, he took sin down with him, but, al but alive, he brings God down to us. From now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue. And you hang on every word. You are dead to sin and alive in God. That's what Jesus did. It's a choice. 
It's a choice that we have to make. And today is another day, another opportunity for you to make that choice. The choice is yours. See, there's a gift under the cross. And you don't have to wait until Christmas morning to open it. There's a gift under that tree. In fact, God has been waiting for you your entire life to open this gift. But it doesn't come wrapped. I like the way God gives gifts. Don't have to waste any tape and paper cuts on it. He doesn't come wrapped. It doesn't come in fancy paper. No, it was wrapped in cloths and it was laid in a manger. Later on, 33 and a half years later, it was wrapped in grave clothes and laid in an empty tomb. See, this gift has been unwrapped. The wrapping has been folded up and left in the empty tomb. This gift is no surprise. This gift is his absolute love and forgiveness for each and every one who would accept him. And he is offering you this forgiveness. He is offering you this help because it's not just forgiveness. See, once I accept his forgiveness, once I recognize everything that he accomplished on the cross and I ask him to forgive me of my sins, it's not just the fact that I'm made clean, but now I'm in relationship, in right standing with God who created everything. And if I am in right standing with him, he also says that we are now adopted into his family. We are a part of his family. We are sons and daughters of God. And if I am a son of the king of kings, guess what? When I'm in trouble, I can ask the king for help. When I'm hurting, I can turn to my father for some comfort. When I need some direction, I can ask him and he can give it. When I just want to lay my heart out because I had a crappy day, I can just start talking to him. God, today sucked. I went through this. This hurts. But your love is so great. There's nothing more wonderful than being able to have relationship with God. This is the gift that is underneath the most important tree. And it's not wrapped. It's not a surprise. The name tags that are on it include every single one on this planet. Because he loves us that much. So this year, on Christmas, in recognition of the fact how he came, how he lived how he died, and how he rose again. In recognition of the truth in the word of God, I need to ask you a simple question. Are you ready? Are you ready? Because your entire life, he has been standing at the door of your heart, and he's been knocking. Revelation talks about that. I love the painting of that verse of of the the, the silhouette of, of Jesus standing at this wooden door. And he's knocking on the door. But if you, if you pay attention to the painting, as he's knocking on this door, there's something about this door that's different than any other door. See, this is symbolically the door of your heart. And something that's different is there's no door handle on the outside. Because he won't come in uninvited. He knocks at the door. Your whole life, he has been knocking at your door, and he has orchestrated all of this so that you can see the truth in his word and accept the greatest Christmas present of all, relationship with God. So are you ready? Are you ready to open up your heart and let God in? That is the message of Christmas. Would you close your eyes for a moment? In this moment, God, right now, I ask that you would speak to our hearts. God, that if there's someone in here today, Lord, if there's people here today that have not accepted you, or maybe they have, but they've turned and they've walked away from you, they haven't been living in a way that recognizes you for who you are. God, right now, I ask that you would speak to their hearts that it wouldn't be a a message of wise and persuasive words from some man, but, Lord, that you, Lord, you would speak to them right now, Jesus.
Nobody's looking around. It's just a private moment. If you haven't been living the life that you know you're intended to live, that's one in relationship with God. And you're ready to open that door. You've been hearing the knocking. I want to ask you, are you ready? Are you ready right now to ask Jesus to forgive, to wash, to make you new, but most importantly, to enter into relationship with God? Because that's what he wants. He wants relationship with you. So if you're here and you've never done it, or maybe you have before, but you recognize that you've walked away, can I tell you that Jesus is the only way to the Father? Jesus is the only way to heaven. All other avenues lead to death and destruction, eternity separated from God. God wants you to open the door to Jesus. So if that's you, would you just, no one's looking, would you just lift a hand so I can pray with you? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 The prayer, it's not a, a written poem. It's not a, a set rule of you got to say these words in this order. It is simply an expression of your heart. Quite often in church, we ask people to pray after us just so that way you understand what we're praying. So let me walk you through it, and then we're going to pray it together. It's a confession. Lord, I, I believe. I believe that you are who you say you are. I believe that you, that you came to this earth and you lived a perfect life. I believe that you died on a cross and you shed your blood so I could be forgiven. See, sin has to be judged, but he paid the price. He already paid the price. And God, I don't want to have to pay it a second time. So Lord, would you forgive me? I recognize I'm not perfect. Would you forgive me? And Lord, I want to live in relationship with you. Change my life, God, so I can live for you. That's the heart of the prayer. So if you lifted your hand or, or you were about to, would you join with me now and let's pray this. God, I love you. And I recognize your love for me. And I believe in your word. And I believe that you came to this earth and you died on a cross, you shed your blood for my sin. I have messed up. I have sinned. Would you forgive me? And God, I want relationship with you. Change my life completely. Come into my life that I might live a new way. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for your love. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant that sincerely from your heart, can I welcome you either to or back to the family of God this morning? You know, the Bible tells us that at this moment right now, there is an uproar going on. People, say, people seem to think that heaven is, is tame, but I, I'm telling you, it's completely different than anything you've ever thought. Because right now in heaven, there is an uproar. There is a party like you've never experienced because there have been some who have given their heart to Jesus. It's the most exciting thing ever when someone's life is transformed. When someone gives their heart to Jesus. Why is it so exciting? Because hell is no longer on the table for them. Amen? Second half of this message response is for those who have been serving. But maybe over the last little while, you have been acting like the gavel has been in your hand. You've been looking at people with judgment, not love. You've been talking about people with judgment, not love. Can I encourage you 
to open your hand and recognize that all it is, all you have is his love. You can't drop the hammer on someone else, but you can lay a hand of love on them. You can reach out in love. So this Christmas season, would you stop the flapping of the gums and would you start reaching out in love? All right. Where am I going with this? I don't know. I kind of lost myself. Ah! This morning we get to celebrate. The fact that people just gave their heart to Jesus is amazing. This morning we get to celebrate as well decisions that had been made already in the past. People who have chosen to serve Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We do something in our church. We do something in the Christian church called water baptism. What water baptism is, is simply this. It is a symbolic act of obedience. See, the Bible tells us that we should. The Bible tells us, Jesus told us, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus told his disciples, therefore go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if you are a disciple of Jesus, you should be baptized, because that's what Jesus asked us to do. Those who are repentant, who've asked God to forgive them, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized. Can I tell you that baptism is not the way to forgiveness? When someone goes underwater and comes up out of water, they're not being forgiven of their sin in that moment. It's symbolic of what has already taken place. It's symbolic of, of, of the death of your old way of life is now dead and buried with Christ on the cross not to come back ever again. That old me is now gone. And when we come up out of the water, it's symbolically saying that now I am completely changed. I have been baptized. I have been dipped. I have been, I have been dyed into a new color. I am now his. See the word baptizo Baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, which is the same word they use for taking a piece of cloth and putting it in a, a, a jar, a vat of oil and, and dye, and it would come up out of the water with a new color to it because it had been baptized and changed. When we are baptized, it's symbolic that we have now been completely changed. You might have recognized the old person, but they're gone now when they come up. They're spiritually recognizing the fact, I'm a new creation in Christ. That old way of living is dead and gone. I don't, I'm not a resident of that place anymore. I'm a new creation in God. It is symbolic, but it's also obedient because Jesus said so. Jesus asked us to. We see it over and over again throughout the book of Acts. We see it in Acts chapter 8, verse 12 with the Samaritans. Uh, but when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. We see it with the Ethiopian eunuch in the chariot, one of my favorites. I'm not going to go there because I'll preach it. <laughs> we see it with the repentant. That Peter gets up on the day of Pentecost. He preaches to a bunch of people who are standing up there going, what is the ruckus going on in the upper room? And he comes out and he preaches a message to them. He tells them about the good news, the gospel, the message of Jesus. 3,000 people were added to their number. And Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So who should be baptized? Every single believer in Christ. If you've confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to be baptized. I've already told you why. Give you one last reason why. Jesus exemplified it. He himself was baptized, not because he had, had to get rid of an old way of life, but because he wanted to lead by example. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Finally, another reason to do it is that you might be a witness to someone else. It's, hey, guess what? This happened in my life. It is now a public declaration of what has already taken place. I am no longer the old person that you used to know. I used to live in sin, but Jesus has forgiven me of that, and that way of life is dead and buried, and I want to let everybody know that I am a follower of God. I'm a part of the way. So that's why we do it. 
So, this morning, let's do it. Tom. Come on, Tom. You, grab, you go right ahead and grab your towel. I'm going to talk about you while you do that. I've loved getting to know Tom over the last while. And ever since we had the park put in, uh, Tom and, and Margaret, they've been at the park so often. And over the last while, we've gotten into some interesting conversations about faith, about God. Tom knows who God is. But when we started talking, he wasn't necessarily living for God. Then, what? Warm. We had an outdoor service in, in August or September. And at that service, Tom made the decision that, hey, I want to make things right, and I want to declare that I am a part of the way. I want Jesus to forgive me. I want that living relationship with God. Can I tell you the most encouraging thing about that entire scenario? It didn't end there. I love that when I, when I walk through the, the parking lot so often, not always, but so often, Tom, I love when I walk by and you're in your van or you're sitting out uh, on a chair or on the rocks or whatever watching your son on the swing that there's this thing in your hand and your nose is in it and you're flipping as he's reading his Bible, getting in deep with God. So I know that this decision that he has made wasn't flippantly made. I don't think anything he does is flippant. He does his research. He studies. He wants to know. He asks the questions. And so, Tom, as you stand here today, is it your confession that you love Jesus with all your heart? 100%. 100%. Is it your desire to serve and follow him for the rest of your life? Absolutely. Then, Tom, why don't you go ahead, Tom, and step into the hot tub? Grab the mic. Oh, Hans, Hans. Hans, grab the mic. And uh, he has a brother that uh, played hockey with my oldest son. And, and, and you know, it, it, anyway, Tom, to see you here today, this is very personal, it, it it's, uh, just warms my heart. And, and like I say, I, I, you know, I know your mother, your brothers, your father, and you, and just to see you here today is, is just uh, super, and, and it just shows you what God can do. When you, when you I, I'm sure when you look where you've come from and where you are today, it just shows you what God can do, and, and um, I think everybody should just know that, that uh, God can do, and I don't want to call it a miracle, but he can, he can do a lot of good things, and to see you here today is just... Uh, as I say, warms, warms my heart greatly, and I look forward to walking with you in Christ and uh, being part of the rest of your life, and, and on and on and on. Good to see you, Tom. Well, Father God, I, I think I've said a lot of it already, but Lord, we just thank you that you've brought Tom into your kingdom, Lord. And Lord, we look that he, he will bring glory to you, Lord, and that you will be in his life and change his life forever, Lord. And we know that you can do that, Lord. Lord, we just ask that you bless him, you bless his family, be with him, Lord, and that he then will become an example to this community of what God can do and what God does in people's lives. Lord, we pray you be with him, bless him, Lord, and uh, we ask this all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I just met Laura this past week, and I don't know how comfortable Laura is with talking in front of people. What? No? Do you want me to talk or do you want to talk? I can talk. Okay. 
<laughs> I met Laura this past week. Laura was at church last Sunday morning. She sat right over on that side over there. Laura and I had been communicating via email back and forth for a little while, and I just assumed, learn a lesson not to assume, because of the email questions that she has just from a different church looking for a church that was open during this season. And uh, she came to church last Sunday, and it was her very first time ever in a faith setting like that. Came out, to, came out to prayer meeting on Sunday night as well. And then we got together and we talked earlier, earlier this week, Christina as well, and we just chatted. And what God has been doing is amazing. I can't preach too much longer. But the fact, Laura, correct me if I'm wrong, it's been a couple of months now that you've been feeling an awakening, a drawing or something to discover who God is, right? All right. So she started looking it up. She got herself a Bible. She went to Google to figure out where to start reading. And where Google told her to read is the exact same place I would have told her to start reading. Sometimes Google might get it right. And can I tell you that over the last couple of months that she has read all of John, all of Matthew, all of Mark. She's diving into Luke because she wants to know God. This morning, she's made that confession that Jesus Christ is her Lord and Savior. Right? So, Laura, is it your desire to serve Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for the rest of your life? Yeah? All right. So, with your confession of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior... I would love the honor to baptize you this morning on the day that you made that confession. Would you jump in the pool? I assume I should talk? Yes, okay. <laughs> it has been such a pastor's joy to watch both Evan and Melissa in their journey with God. Amen. Watching them come alive in who God is just over a couple of years ago, uh, moving beyond the, yeah, there is a God, to, oh my goodness, he loves me has been absolutely inspiring. And then not just to do it, but then to want to see others do it so much that they would go out of their comfort zone. You can see that she's not super comfortable <laughs> here. But to go out of their comfort zone to lead Alpha yeah. because they want to see others know him more than they care about how comfortable they are in that moment. So Melissa, I know the answer to this already, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Melissa, is it your confession that Jesus Christ is Lord? Is it your confession that you desire to serve him for every single day of your life? Yes? Would you move a little bit forward for me? Excellent. There you go. There we go. Evan, would you pray over your wife first? Heavenly Father, I'd just like to thank you, Lord, for this amazing woman that you've blessed me with, Lord. 
Lord, it says in your word that a man is blessed when he finds a good woman, Lord, and I know that I found a good woman, a woman that has a desire to serve you, Lord, a woman who just loves to love people like you love people, Lord. Lord, I'm just thankful for her courage today, Lord, to take this step, that even when the devil is knocking at our door and pushing and fighting, that you are stronger, Lord, yeah. because Jesus died on the cross and he conquered you. Jesus conquers all. Melissa, upon your confession of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Come on now. You may have met Serena very briefly as you come in through the front door. She's been uh, doing the sign-in registration and all that. Serena, you've been a part of our church now for just a short time, right? Four months. When did you give your life to Jesus? You've always been a Christian. Well, when I got here, my relationship with God got more deep. I started fasting, um, Bible study. So what you're saying is your faith is coming alive. Right? And it is your confession to serve Him as your Lord and Savior. Every day of your life? Yes. Then Serena, would you go ahead and hop right in? Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 